Now I know what some of you might be thinking. Holy shit, Berserk Part 3 is out already? Not exactly. This is simply a, I guess you could call a sneak preview, or just sort of this specific independent chunk that I've taken away from Part 3 and released as a Halloween special, because fuck it, it's that time of the year, you know? May as well enjoy it. Now as stated, this is not the full length thing, it's only about an hour and a half, but it's still the beginning, I guess you could say. Because the way I view it, this specific part of the manga can be an independent thing, while if we're talking about Conviction at large, uh, you kinda need both. But, you know, fuck it. May as well release something for Halloween, it's a special time of the year. Now, part 3 at large is probably gonna be out late November, around then. Or probably even December if we're really unlucky. Nevertheless, enjoy the video. It's been a long time coming. The next step of our journey through the fantasy epic Berserk. In part one, we were introduced to our protagonist, Guts, a violent, cruel demon hunter that is hunting after the monsters that wronged him. At first, we're led to believe he's just a sociopath, a complete asshole that bullies innocent people and shows no regard for the safety of others. But there were hints that his traumatic quest was actually starting to get to him. Bits and pieces that showed he really did have some humanity buried under the surface. The character of Puck was the vehicle to explore this side of Guts, his goofy, fun-loving nature clashing with the cold-hearted and dark exterior, and Puck's magical abilities showed that Guts was essentially shutting out his feelings with pitch-black hate. Yet we didn't really follow these two for that long. We had maybe about 8 chapters or so, and then we moved on to the absolutely massive flashback arc we covered in Part 2. Golden Age was all about giving Guts every ounce of context necessary to explain who he is, along with the setting at large. Why he's hunting demons, how he became disfigured. So much was covered in Part 2, it was 3 hours long alone. It introduced a lovable cast of eccentric mercenaries, characters we grew to care about and really admire then brutally killed them. Guts himself showed many different layers that developed him from the archetypical edgy swords boy he was in Black Swordsman. Plus, it gave our protagonist actual history in the world. It went from big sword guy in not Dark Ages Europe to fully fleshed out dark fantasy. Guts lost his family as a child, found a new one in the Band of the Hawk, left that family out of fear his best friend didn't really care about him, fell in love with a woman, realized he could truly be happy with her and plans to run away, only to learn his actions had consequences, and his dreams in life were over before they started. He threw away his chances at fulfillment and realized too late it was impossible to put things back together. Then, when the eclipse happened to close off our flashback, it spelled out in no uncertain terms why Guts became as vicious as he did. The man survived actual hell only to be cursed for the rest of his life. That new family Guts grew to love was slaughtered by monsters. He will be hunted until he's cold in the ground. The woman he loves is completely insane and a shell of her former self. His best friend is the one who damned them all and made Guts watch as he violated the love of his life. Even his unborn child was corrupted into being a demon. This is all in the flashback arc that explained why a dude wears all black and has a big sword. There's overkill, and then there's writing a Shakespearean tragedy to explain why your OC has a black cloak. Never say Miura was anything but detailed. But now that's finally over, it's time to talk about... 
the Berserk prototype. That's right, Berserk technically has a prequel prototype thing. This was the first draft of the story Miura came up with before dedicating to the final product we see in the manga. And unlike the Lost Chapter, Chapter 83, which we covered in Part 2, this is actually in every copy of Volume 14 that's out there. Since technically Volume 14 is the ending of Golden Age, and it sort of acts as a transition between Old Berserk and New Berserk. You get to see how the series was originally going to be before you come back to current events. That's not to say that it comes immediately after Golden Age. You actually get a few chapters into the next arc, and then it closes out that volume with the prototype. It's sort of weird, but that's how it works. And it's better to cover this now instead of cutting out partway through the next arc to talk about what essentially amounts to a big easter egg. Nevertheless, this is actually the version of Berserk Mior came up with when he was in college back in 1988. The manga itself began publication in 1989, so he basically has some ideas down pat and it's just about ironing out specifics. But there are stark differences between the prototype and final Berserk. Guts' design is the first noticeable change. He still has his signature black cloak, his massive sword, and his iron left hand, but he's got an eye patch covering over the eye he lost. There's other differences too, but I'll explain them as we go along through the chapter itself. The prototype opens up with Guts walking past rows of skeletons impaled on stakes. Now the first thing he actually does is make an offhanded comment to Puck, which shows us that the two are already friends by the time this version of the story opens up. Which is kind of interesting because you don't get to see the scene in the tavern where he murders the bandits and saves Puck. Instead, we're supposed to assume these two have been together for at least a little bit by this point. Anyway, they spot some bandits attacking a wagon in the distance. We see the bandits have cornered the girl driving the wagon and try to rape her. Well, just before they can get started, they're all killed by crossbow fire. The village girl looks up to see Guts holding a big crossbow, and while it's not the automatic one he had before, it still shows he uses it as a weapon. So I guess the idea is he just loads them really fast. The scene is actually pretty similar to what you see at the beginning of Sword of the Berserk Guts' Rage, so it's possible that game treated this as sort of a reference. Which makes sense considering Miura wrote that game as well, so he probably just wanted to add a little nod to what came before. Still, the girl is in shock as she watches Guts go right to the overturned carriage we can assume is hers and complains about the lack of food. She tries to warn him about a surviving bandit coming up right behind, but he's already a step ahead. He cleaves the guy in two with his sword. Very similar to the first kill with the Dragon Slayer we see in the first volume, but this version of the sword is slightly different. It's still the same basic shape as the Dragon Slayer, but it's got these sort of wingtips looking things right near the hilt. Still, the bandit is dead and Guts takes his leave. The girl he unintentionally saved reveals her leg is hurt, and Guts reluctantly takes it upon himself to take her home on a horse he stole from the dead robbers. And if you're feeling some weird sense of deja vu looking at the village girl, it might be because she sort of looks like early Griffith. In fact, a popular fan theory is that her design and the prototype inspired Griffith's design, since there are a lot of references to Griffith's beauty making him look almost androgynous. Is there any weight to the theory? No clue. But it's a conversation starter. During the horse ride, the girl takes note of Guts' metal arm and eye patch. She's startled by Guts yelling at Puck, who flies out of his pouch, much to her delight, as she's never seen an elf before. Meanwhile, Guts is far less impressed. There's some more banter as Guts complains about a lack of food, and Puck demands he walks so it gives the elf more space on the horse. They're obviously just riffing on each other, and once again it kind of establishes their friendship. The girl laughs as she decides that, since an elf is following Guts, he couldn't possibly be a bad guy. Well, they arrive at her village, the rest of the town's surprised to see her come back alive, but they're relieved she's safe. And we learn the girl's name is Frika. She tells the village about how Guts saved her from the bandits, and we cut to later that night. During dinner, Frika's uncle explains that the town is being tormented by the local lord, Vlad Tepes. Ten years ago, during a war with another country, Vlad took over 500 prisoners and had them impaled on stakes, lining them against the border including priests and entire families, and they've been under strict orders not to remove them ever since. There's some pretty obvious Vlad the Impaler vibes they're trying to get across if it's not obvious by now. Well, after the war ended, Vlad turned against his own people, and ever since he's ordered the capture of young women from his territory, where they would be tortured and killed in his castle. The villagers discovered his evil intentions when they found a skewered body of a woman in the river behind the castle, and four women have already vanished from the village after being ordered up to his keep. Frika was intended to be the fifth sacrifice. Her family simply wanted her to run away, but Frika didn't want any other girl to suffer the same fate as the others. Guts shows little regard to the peasant's suffering as he asks for more food and beer, and the leaders of the village gather at Frika's place to try and hire Guts as an assassin. They're willing to give whatever they have for Guts to kill Lord Vlad. 
though he refuses, saying the job is too risky and why should he give a shit about a bunch of villagers with no decent reward anyway. An old woman begs Guts to avenge her granddaughter, who is actually the one they found in the river, but he's not biting. Even telling her point blank, he doesn't care. The rest of the village is disgusted at Guts' behavior, and even Puck rips into him for being a selfish jackass. Puck says that he should understand more than anyone what they've been going through losing a family member, but Gut swears they'll get over it. Then Frika runs up to meet him one last time. She admits she told the rest of the village Guts was a powerful knight, so it was her fault they tried to pressure him into taking the job. She tries to apologize, but Guts still says he doesn't care. She's disappointed, but she asks Guts to keep a memento of his to remember him by. Guts isn't sure what to give since he's only really carrying weapons with him, but he decides to give her his eye patch. Frika is appreciative of the gift and runs off. Puck is still mad, sarcastically asking him if he actually does want to save her, and then he rants about how Guts doesn't seem to care about anyone but himself, saying he's a bitter scumbag that only lives for dead people. This sets off Guts, who grabs Puck and goes on a pretty revealing rant. It turns out Guts watched his own mother be devoured by demons while she was still alive. She turned into meat in front of him. So now this is life for Guts. Just bitterness and hate. He does apologize for hurting Puck, but his mind is set. He only cares about hunting demons and nothing else. Well, just as he says all this, he notices Frika riding away in a carriage, and a certain symbol on the door catches Guts' attention. Yep, this is the prototype's version of the Brand of Sacrifice. Not really worth trying to hide it, it's pretty obvious. It's certainly different from the actual one, it's more curved while the original is very jagged and angular, but it still looks almost the same. Now a lot of you might have picked up on some subtle and not so subtle differences between actual Berserk and prototype Berserk. Guts' personality is a bit goofier here than his usual very stern self, especially considering this is technically Black Swordsman era. That's not to say he's completely comedic, but you can definitely tell there's more humor with him here than before. Even the way his face is drawn leans a bit harder into being silly. He's got a big frown like a One Piece character, and his face stretches when he's mad or acting smug. Now when he's genuinely pissed off, you see Guts resemble more of his actual self, very sharp and tense. But during quiet scenes, the Guts we have here acts more like a lovable asshole than a psychotic asshole. Puck actually stays pretty consistent between real Berserk and prototype Berserk. He looks the same and pretty much acts the same too, acting as Guts' moral compass that shows clear frustration at his self-centeredness. But of course this leads to the most obvious difference between prototype and regular. Guts' tragedy in the prototype is watching his mother be eaten alive by demons as a child. Now compared to what we saw in the Eclipse, this sort of feels bog standard. And considering his entire journey in Golden Age revolved around finding a family, you know, something he's never really had before, and losing them in the worst possible way, I can see why this plot point didn't really stick. Guts never having people who cared about him helped sell how tragic he is as a character. The one time he found a place to belong in, a real family, he took it for granted. He didn't really understand what was actually given to him, and then he was forced to watch them all suffer and die. That extra layer gives the loss more impact, more identity in a way. Just saying his mom died sort of relies on you putting the emotional beats together yourself. His mom died because of demons. You feel bad because you care about your mom and don't want her to die from demons. That's not to say it's cheap, plenty of good stories have dead parents. Just that it's kind of a surface level tragedy unless it's fully explored and is the intent. With the Band of the Hawk, we watch friendships form as the story goes on. Guts grows from this apathetic outsider to somebody who finally found a home. It's all about build-up. You spend time with a character and become accustomed to them. So when they die, it comes out of nowhere and has more impact. Show don't tell, you know? Very basic writing rule. You don't want to just say someone died, you want to show it happening. Of course, this is a hypothetical first chapter. You know, the idea is this is the introduction to the story. So the assumption is more details would have fleshed out this aspect if Miura actually stuck with it. We might have had a completely different backstory with Guts if Miura decided to go through with this idea of Berserk. Now coming back to the chapter, we transition to Lord Vlad's temple. Frika is taken inside the gate and brought before him. He's creepy, right out of the gate and waste no time showing he's a literal monster. Weird monster eyes and 
monster teeth. He's a monster, okay? And just as it looks like Freaka is dead meat, our classic all is lost moment, a crossbow pierces Vlad's eye. Despite all the bloviating and edginess and being a complete douchebag and also an inconsiderate jackass and fuck you, Guts wasn't gonna let Freaka die. Vlad tries to say some shit, a typical bad guy speech, and he gets another crossbow bolt right through the mouth. Despite his wounds, the guy isn't dying, so Guts' suspicions were correct. Vlad is a full-blown demon. The platform Guts is standing on explodes, and he has to dodge out of the way of a pile of very sharp objects coming to impale him. He manages to avoid most of the spears, but unfortunately he does get a few lodged right in his abdomen. Vlad takes time to brag, but Guts starts shit-talking as well. Of course he didn't die. Though he actually did get impaled through the stomach, it looks like that really fucking hurt. Guts rips out the spear and unsheaths the Dragon Slayer, ready to rock and roll. He also calls Vlad a Dog of Vuana. This is another difference between the prototype and the actual story, but I'll have to explain a bit of that later. Vlad transforms into his demon form, and he talks about how humans shouldn't know the name of the God of Darkness, Vuana. Oh shit, well I guess he explained it for me. Yeah, there's no god hand in the prototype. Instead, it's the typical demon king thing you see in fantasy anime. Though instead of managing McDonald's, he has Vlad the Impaler as a buddy. Hard to really compare an offhanded comment about a shadowy main villain with actually seeing villains do villain shit, so I'm not gonna bother. All I will say is I'm not crazy about the name Vuana. It sounds weird, like an Italian soda brand or something. I might have to find a case on Amazon. Nevertheless, Vlad is full-on monster mode. Also, if you're wondering why I just call him a demon instead of an apostle, is because the term isn't really used that much in this. Vlad calls himself an apostle, and Puck uses the term when talking about Vlad in passing, but eh, it still doesn't really feel concrete, you know? Actual demons in Berserk and even the God Hand use the term all the time. Even Wylad, who is a complete hedonistic madman with little regard for anything else but having fun, called himself an apostle. In this, it feels more like a romanticized description of what Vlad was. Even if he says that's what he is, you wouldn't call a psycho monster with bird wings an angel, would you? Actually, save that for later. Anyway, Guts and Vlad fight, and it's very similar to the first battle with the Snake Lord from the first chapter. It plays out practically the same, even down to the demon grabbing Guts and bragging to his face about how he's gonna eat him. Then Guts blows his head off with the arm cannon and slices him in half. It's pretty obvious the prototype heavily influenced the first chapter. Hell, it's almost literally a first draft in a way. Well, as Vlad is bleeding to death, he notices the brand of sacrifice on Guts' chest. This one bigger than the small spot it takes up on his neck. And of course, we get the part where Guts reveals he's been sacrificed, and that caused his hatred of demons. Only instead of a burning building collapsing on top of him, it's a large chunk of the castle that crushes his skull. Still pretty good. You know, nice and visceral. Anyway, the trio escape from the castle, and Frika is safely returned home. All's well that ends well. Guts swears that saving her was just incidental. He just killed his enemy. He didn't want to save the cutie. But Puck thinks about how much scarier Guts seemed than Vlad, almost sinister by comparison. Guts takes his leave, but Puck still demands they he treat the guy's wounds, showing that elf dust is still absolutely a thing, and Puck is basically there to act as the therapist and the medic. Guts simply responding that he'll give the demons as much blood and flesh as they want while he drives steel into their heads. And with that, the prototype comes to a close, the two walking off into the distance to end the chapter. Now, you can see why this is a prototype, a simple standalone adventure that gives hints towards a larger universe. Now, obviously, there are elements that didn't make the cut, the Demon King Vuana, some of the designs of Guts' weapons, the brand of sacrifice, the death of his mother, the eye patch. but it's actually something that, with a few tweaks, would have fit snugly into Black Swordsman. It's still fun, and it's interesting to see what came before the actual manga, especially considering this was only a year before the manga officially started. Remember, it came out in 88, while the manga debuted in 89. So Miura had most of what he wanted with Berserk thought out. It was just smaller details that changed and, ironically, snowballed into major plot points later. Because Miura admitted that during Black Swordsman, he didn't really have a plan. So with all these tiny details kind of combining together into one idea, it drastically affected the story. And that's kind of funny, considering that a major theme of Berserk is exactly that, the effects of causality and details causing details later to change, which cause details later to change, and eventually, an entire outcome and event is shifted in your favor, or the exact opposite. Something that, in this coming arc, you are especially going to pick up on as a theme. But really, think about all the little details in the prototype that were changed, and the effect they had on the actual story of Berserk. Because he didn't continue with the idea of Guts' mother being eaten by demons, we got all of Golden Age and the tragedy with the Eclipse and the Band of the Hawk, and by extension, Casca. 
Because he didn't stick with the Demon King Vuana, we got the idea of evil and the God Hand and Griffith. Kind of funny to really think about. In a way, it was the smaller details that got left behind in the prototype that led to the really famous parts of Berserk. Because Miura didn't rely on safe and easy tropes, he had to replace them with something. And I already mentioned where it led, dude took a gamble and it royally paid off. And speaking of taking risks... It's time to talk about a fan-favorite arc. Technically, it's part of the larger arc known as Conviction, but it's just so good that it's become its own arc in the eyes of fans. One that is so metal, so hardcore, so dark and twisted that it's still yet to receive any attempt at adapting it. There have been hints, yes. Berserk 97 sort of implies it would have happened if it continued, but as of this video, there has been zero official adaptations to the infamous Lost Children arc. And for a good reason too. This shit is so hype that cowards who do not even smoke crack cannot handle it. Lost Children is absolutely incredible for countless reasons. For one, it's noteworthy for bringing us back to the present, timeline-wise. Turns out it's been a full two years since the eclipse, and we can assume the Black Swordsman took place a year before Conviction. So the timeline works like this. Golden Age comes first, chronologically. Black Swordsman is roughly a year after that, since we see Guts shows clear experience in fighting demons and understands more about his curse than at the end of Golden Age, and Conviction is a year after that. There's no official answer confirming this, it just sort of lines up. Some people argue Conviction is a few months after Black Swordsman, and that would also make sense. Because it would be a perfect amount of time for Guts and Puck to be traveling together, and not have some form of a relationship still. Another reason this arc is so famous is because it's sort of the point where the art really peaked style-wise. It hits a perfect balance between gritty horror and beautiful fantasy. That's not to say the art is bad after this, I mean, goddamn. But simply, this is the point that managed to not lean too hard in any direction. It doesn't look too rough, and it doesn't look too soft. There's also the, uh, really well-known reason this arc is talked about, but let's not spoil anything just yet. Where's the fun? The arc starts off just a little bit after the eclipse. A unit of knights ride past a mother and her young child. Turns out these are the Holy Iron Chain Knights, an army for the Holy See. Essentially, these guys are foot soldiers for the Vatican. We see some of the members bantering as they ride. A man by the name of Serpico teases his friend Azan by saying the woman they rode past is a looker and probably his type, but Azan is not interested in playing along. They were sent to investigate a possible sign of God, and this idiot was busy looking at women. They're both told to can it by their commander, a woman on a regal looking horse, and it turns out they found their objective, the Red Lake. It's the remains of the Band of the Hawk, torn apart and unrecognizable. The way the commander sees it, this is a sign right out of prophecy. When the sun dies five times, a red lake will appear to the west of the city with a name both old and new. And it's a prophecy specifically predicting the birth of what they call the Hawk of Darkness. Master of the sinful black sheep, king of the blind white sheep. The one who will call down an age of darkness to the world. Basically the Antichrist. Man. I wonder who this is talking about. What bird guy could this prophecy be referring to? Sun dying five times? That sounds like an eclipse where the sun goes dark for a little bit. And five? That's like how you have five fingers on your hand. You need five to make a hand. And this prophecy is biblical, so it's like you need five to make a hand that's close to God. Yeah, the foreshadowing here is a little bit blatant. The God Hand are gonna do evil shit to the world, and Griffith in particular is gonna be involved. Well, take that little seed and put it in the back of your mind. Because now we're jumping two years ahead to a dark, rainy forest. Some bandits are complaining about the lack of loot to steal, mentioning that times are getting tougher. The most they manage to snatch is a little girl who they plan to sell off. Well, one bandit decides to take his pants off because it turns out he's a moderator for Reset Era, but luckily she fights him off with a kick to the groin. The ruffians then talk about the history of the tree they're sitting under. The forest itself was used by a cult of heretics who would cut people's stomachs open and make them walk around trees with their intestines staked into them. And that very tree is one of the ones they used for their sacrifices. To prove his point, the bandit telling the story shows the stakes buried into the wood, even saying the bumps in the tree look like human faces. This causes the pedophile bandit to get an idea. He wants to see if the story could actually be true, so he plans on cutting the girl's belly open and making her walk around the tree. As he's cutting her dress open, a chestnut falls onto his hand, the spike stinging his fingers. They all look into the darkness trying to spot who threw it, and they see Guts sitting by himself, his cloak shielding him from the rain. 
At first, the little girl assumes he's a forest ghost, but Guts rises to his feet and complains about his lack of sleep. The bandits try to talk tough, the pedophile one even licking the blade of his knife, but Guts doesn't give a shit, even pushing the blade of the knife into the pedophile bandit's tongue. Instead, he wants to know if the story about the sacrifices is actually true. The storyteller says it's legit, and Guts tries to warn them all to leave. Well, the bandits take it as a threat and prepare to fight, but Guts is a step ahead, breaking the jaw of the leader bandit with his metal arm. This escalates the situation, but right before they can fight, Guts feels his brand. He tries to warn the bandits, and now the tree is looking at them. Not only was the story true, the tree is possessed by the spirits of the dead who were murdered by the cult. Now, this is something that actually does crop up in adaptations to Berserk, even if this specific part isn't covered. Berserk PS2 has the tree as an enemy type you fight, same with Berserk Muso, though it never actually touches Lost Children material. Berserk 2016 actually covers the bandits in the forest, but changes the scene to not include the little girl or guts. Instead, this happens at the same time as the wagon and the skeletons. It's sort of an icon to the series in kind of a funny way. For good reason too, it looks fucking dope. The idea of a demonically possessed tree sounds sort of silly, but hey, Evil Dead. Plus, you look at this thing and tell me with a straight face it is not metal as fuck. Especially when it sends its branches down and turns some of the bandits into paint. Their brains and eyeballs flying through the air from sheer force. The surviving bandits run for their lives at the horrific flesh-eating tree, and the little girl is left behind, collapsing to the ground, petrified at the horrors. But Guts does what he does best, and takes a swing, his sword flying over her head and tearing into the demon tree. Some of the branches are ripped off, and it actually bleeds, blood spraying out from the wounds. So not only is the tree possessed, it's been transformed into a living creature. The whole time the little girl is watching, she repeats the famous catchphrase to describe the dragon slayer. It was much too big to be called a sword. Massive, thick, heavy, and far too rough. Indeed, it was like a slab of raw iron. Guts is back, baby. This arc actually has sort of an interesting thing going on with this kid. She's sort of our narrator. Guts is our protagonist, but this arc is almost being told from the perspective of this kid. It fits thematically with what's to come. Lost Children specifically focuses on the trials of being a child in the world of Berserk. Guts' situation wasn't great, but as you'll soon see, it's not really much better being a normal kid in this setting. Still, our narrator watches the fight between Guts and the Demon Tree. She's astonished at his skills, able to fight off the monster, dodge its attacks, and explode its head with the cannon in his arm. And to finish it off, Guts uses the momentum of the cannon blast to increase the speed of his sword swing. She was so terrified she could barely move, the bandits were slaughtered and ran for their lives, but this random stranger not only fought this nightmarish creature, he won. She sees spirits rising from the bark, the sun peeking through the clouds and perching the spirits from the forest. Guts remarks that it's the first time he's seen the sun in three days. Well, just as the little girl calms down, a remaining spirit in the tree tries to bite her, but it's chased out of the bark by a chestnut landing on it. Turns out, it was Puck who started the altercation with the bandits, using his special technique, Bloody Needle, where he throws the chestnut at you. He admits to using Guts as the muscle to save the girl, but she reacts negatively. She starts screaming her head off, which causes Puck to drop a chestnut on his own head. Guts tries to write off the incident as the two being crybabies, but then she claims Puck is an elf from Misty Valley and for some reason, that's something that causes her to shake in fear. We cut back to the bandits as they've been running through the forest since last night. Soon they're consumed in a heavy fog, and start to hear laughing all around them. As the men begin to panic, they spot elves flying all around. The leader of the bandits can't believe what he's seeing, saying that this ain't some kid's fairy tale. But one of the elves insists that's exactly what it is, a fairy tale for children. Yep, say hello to the moth demon that attacked Rickert back in Golden Age. She's our villain this go around. We don't see what happens to the bandits, but considering what we saw her do earlier, let's just assume it's very, very bad. So Lost Children is kind of a monster of the week type story. It has the typical formula you saw during Black Swordsman. Gut shows up at a new place, fights some bad men, and through fighting the bad man learns about a new demon nearby for him to also fight. However, what actually happens here has some serious consequences in more than a few ways, but I can't talk about that until we get to the larger plot. Just know that this entire segment, and honestly conviction at large along with the next arc after, revolves around a conflict within Guts. Is Guts a monster or is he a man? Is he still capable of redemption or has he completely fallen to the dark side? It's the overwhelming question that dictates a lot of what is about to come. 
Now of course, if this is your first experience with Berserk and don't know what's on the horizon, you're gonna say Guts is a good man. He's simply traumatized by horrific experiences. There's no way for him to be well and truly evil. But as you'll soon see, both sides have some legitimate arguments. Coming back to the chapter, the little girl Guts rescued leads him and Puck back to her village. It's small and rundown, nearly abandoned. People stay hidden inside their homes and watch our group with suspicion. The little girl walks up to what we assume is her house and peeks inside the door, reeling back when her mother calls out for her. We learn her name is Jill, and she went missing from the village sometime last night. Her mother was worried sick while her father… doesn't give a shit. Jill's dad is an alcoholic asshole that only cares about sharing old war stories with his buddies. His friends seem to be thankful she's okay, but Jill is visibly uncomfortable when one says he's sorry about last night. Jill's father demands she go buy him booze and beats her with his cane when she tries to call him out for not caring about his family. Her father is obsessed with his time in the military, probably the only time he was ever actually useful for somebody, and is angry at his sacrifice being squandered by his family. He's pretty merciless towards Jill, beating her and berating her over and over again, with his wife begging him to stop, basically in the middle of the street. The only thing that actually gets the guy to back off is Puck throwing a chestnut at his head, something that's kind of becoming a signature move of his. Jill's father tries to pin the blame on Guts, but he's quick to throw the elf under the bus. And as it turns out, Jill isn't the only one terrified of elves. At the mere sight of Puck, the entire village turns against them. Jill's mother drags her into the house, and the rest of the villagers surround Guts with weapons. They threaten him to hand over Puck, who is begging Guts to ski Dad Dole out of there. An old lady takes a swing with a farming hoe, but lands flat on her face when she dodges, now just begging them to get back her grandchild. The village interprets this as Guts attacking the old lady and move in to try and kill him. Yeah, fuck these people. Like, trust me, you're you're gonna be on my side by the end of this. Fuck these people. Guts considers killing a few of the assholes to scare the rest off, but Puck begs him not to. He also spots Jill looking at him from the doorway, trying to scream in vain at the crowd to stop. This seems to snap Guts out of his original idea. Instead, he unleashes the Dragon Slayer and splits a wagon in half. With the cargo flying in the air, he takes the opportunity to escape while the crowd is distracted. Guts manages to lose the villagers and hides out under the town walls. He's visibly frustrated at how the situation fell apart, and Puck is infuriated at being treated like a menace. He goes on a rant about how actually, elves are lovable and cute, so they should be respected and treated with praise. Also, he accuses the villagers of being sex offenders, which… he's not wrong. Anyway, Guts is annoyed that Puck is still following him, taking up space in one of his satchels as his new home. But the elf considers himself a good luck charm for the brute. Jill finds the duo and tells them to hide out in the old windmill just outside of town. Nobody goes into it since it broke down, meaning they should be safe inside. She offers to sneak out and bring them food after sundown, but Guts insists she stay away from him until dawn, unless she wants a repeat of that previous night. We cut to that night and see Jill back at home. She's in a room watching through the doorway as her father abuses her mother for taking too long to bring him and his friends booze. She sees one of her dad's friends walking towards her room, drunkenly claiming he's trying to take a piss. But Jill seems to understand what his real intentions are. She quickly barricades her door, quivering in fear, as the grown man tries to enter her bedroom. When he finally leaves, Jill covers herself in Guts' cloak and cries. I'm hoping you guys caught up to the implications here. It's not fun, to put it politely. But I did tell you guys, this arc was heavy. It's all about the suffering of children. From abuse, to neglect, to well... Let's not spoil things just yet. Just know, if you're a fan of schadenfreude, you're probably gonna enjoy this a lot. As dawn breaks, Jill sneaks out to the windmill Guts and Puck are at. She spots him sitting in the corner, sleeping as some spirits floating near him are burned away by the sunlight. She tries to wake him up, but Puck asks her to let him be. He only just fell asleep. She wraps Guts in his cloak and sits down next to him. To Jill, Guts is from a strange world, a swordsman dressed in all black traveling with an elf. It's clear she's fascinated by the man, seeing him as almost a pseudo-father figure. He's the only symbol of strength and protection she's had in her life. Her actual father is cruel to her, and her mother is powerless to stop him. So of course Jill shows an interest in the one man, the mysterious stranger, that risked his life to save hers. Some time later, we see an incubus slither down to try and attack Guts, but he crushes it against the wall with his metal arm. He's awake, and frustrated at having no proper sleep in, count him, four days now. He looks down to see Jill sleeping in his lap. Her basket of food lay down in front of his leg. It seems she was waiting for him to wake up. Guts notices the bruises on her face and hands, and shows a twinge of sympathy for the girl, which makes sense considering his own circumstances. 
Not just that Guts practically went through the exact same shit Jill is going through during his own childhood, even down to the implied sexual abuse. Hell, it's something we've seen a few times. Guts really doesn't like kids getting hurt. He was traumatized after the murder of Adonis to the point he was in a daze for what we can assume was hours. Plus, the incident with Teresa during Guardians of Desire, where he acted like a detached asshole trying to push her into suicide, but the minute he thought nobody was looking, he started crying, and now Jill is invoking similar feelings. And to take a step further, all the times after Golden Age where we see Guts deal with children, there's an extra layer of tragedy. Remember, Guts was going to be a father himself before the eclipse happened. Now, this isn't something that's ever explicitly stated, at least not yet, but with this arc coming right after Golden Age, which ended with the reveal of Casca's pregnancy and the loss of their baby, it's kind of tragically fitting. How do you follow up a story beat about the loss of a child? Dedicate an entire arc to how cruel this world is towards children. Back on point, Jill wakes up after Puck falls on her head, and she sees Guts is on his feet. He asks her what's so special about Misty Valley, and Jill explains that the valley east of the village was always filled with mist, all year round. Not only that, but legends point to elves having lived there, so it became a popular story among the villagers. She also reveals that for the last few years, the villages around the area have been attacked by mysterious monsters. They devour crops, kill livestock, and every single witness to the attacks claim they're the elves of Misty Valley. Puck refuses to believe actual elves are attacking villages, but Jill describes the monsters as tiny people with insect wings on their backs. She also says something about the elves not seeming right to her. Not the fact that the elves eat people and kidnap children, nah, that's fine, don't worry about that. Something else is strange about them. Well, just as they finish their conversation, Guts's brand starts bleeding. He runs outside to see a swarm of elves coming for the village, and Guts seems to realize what's going on before Puck and Jill. They aren't elves, they're something else. They're full-blown demons. The demon elves rip through the village, consuming everything in their path, tearing through guard dogs, livestock, even bursting into a nearby home and devouring the family inside, laughing while they kill them. We see Jill's father beat her mother for trying to go outside and find her. To him, it was Jill's fault for going outside in the first place, so it wouldn't be their fault if she died. Once again, this dude's an asshole. The surviving boy from the massacred family runs outside, chased by a swarm of demons taunting him to go play with them. But the boy runs straight into Guts, who simply tells him to stay down. He rips through the swarm using the blade of his sword as a fly swatter. The rest of the village in awe at the sight. That weird guy from yesterday just killed a bunch of tiny monsters they've been terrified of for years. Guts takes a good look at the scene, the dead family, and most importantly, the elves. Just like the woman we saw in the beginning of the arc, they're more of an insect-human hybrid than actual elves. Puck has insect wings, but he doesn't look like a bug monster, he just looks like a little person with insect wings. Kind of a traditional fairy, like something you'd expect from Tinkerbell. But these guys have obvious insect qualities. Plus, Guts' brand reacts to them when elves so far have had very positive connotations, when the brand is supposed to react to evil. Of course, we understand they're the minions to whoever the Moth Woman is, but even then, they don't look like a moth. They're more reminiscent of wasps. Guts asks the boy if he wants to avenge his parents or go with the elves that killed them. The kid makes the obvious choice, and Guts interprets this as permission to use him as bait to attract the rest of the swarm attacking the settlement. I mean, I think he skipped a few steps here, but whatever. Jill and Puck come in to see Guts hanging a small child off the tip of his sword, so it's possible they didn't get the full context for why this is okay. The rest of the village definitely got the message. They're still as useless as always, choosing to huddle inside and complain about Guts using this bait instead of doing anything to try and help. Well, with the terrified, screaming child acting as a lure, the rest of the swarm comes flying towards them. Guts leads them on a chase, the poor kid forced to look at the evil monsters trying to grab onto his face, while the psycho adult he just met uses him as live bait. Guts manages to herd the swarm over to a nearby barn. He throws the boy onto the ground and tells him not to move, even as the barn is filled with demons. Confident they finally caught their prey, the elves turn into their demonic forms looking more like wasps than ever before, even growing abdomens with stingers. As they close in, Guts cuts down the rafters of the barn, tosses a bottle of gunpowder to the ground, and sets off his arm cannon. Using the momentum of the cannon blast, Guts escapes the barn by bursting through the wall behind him. With the dust, lumber, and gunpowder all being ignited at once, the barn goes up in flames. The young boy he used as bait desperately running away as fast as possible. He falls to the ground in front of Guts, who thanks him for doing a good job as bait. His reward? 
He gets to watch the monsters who murdered his parents burn in front of him. Jill and Puck watch from a distance as the leader of the elves reveals herself in front of Guts. Now, if you're reading this volume by volume, you see why I covered the prototype immediately, because that cliffhanger is what closes off volume 14, right after is the prototype chapter. And then you're screwed until volume 15. And to sort of take a minute to talk about what we just saw, you're kind of seeing what I mean by Guts is kind of evil, just a little bit, you know, just a tiny little bit though. Even if he clearly has some sympathy for Jill's situation, the fact the dude used a random village boy as bait to kill monsters kinda gates that little bit of humanity we just saw. Even if the kid turned out okay, because I really do fully believe Guts intended for the kid to stay alive, that shit was risky, to say the least. That's the strategy a crazy person would come up with. Now I'm not mad at this. You know, I'm not actually upset Guts did this. In fact, him becoming so reckless and hot-headed and bloodthirsty is part of the reason I really enjoy this arc. I'm simply pointing out that this is the start of something really bad with the guy. Coming back from our cliffhanger, we see the Queen of the Elves flying in the air above Guts. She's just as bubbly as the rest of her elves. Even after Guts tries to kill her with his throwing knives, she's still wearing a big smile and confidently smacking them away. Guts insults the Queen for pretending to be an elf when he actually knows what she is, and that's something that actually does seem to set her off. She calls upon her swarm, who all accuse Guts of being a lying grown-up, which kind of gets Puck's attention. He picks up on it and realizes that they don't seem like actual elves. Instead, Puck realizes a bit too late what they really are. The Queen flies down to attack Guts, covering him in her wing dust and stinging his arm with her proboscis, all the while Puck's trying to intervene in the battle with the Queen. She takes some time to gloat over her attack working, and we've yet to see what she actually means by this. All the while, Puck is trying to tell Guts what's going on, but the big guy isn't listening. It takes Puck literally screaming in his ear for his message to get across to him. The monsters aren't elves. They're children human children. Somehow, the queen transformed the children she kidnapped into monsters like her. It's why the families die while the little kids are taken away. She notices Puck speaking with Guts and accuses him of being Pecaf the Outcast. The two don't recognize the name, but Jill seems to know what she's talking about. The queen comes in for another sweep attack, saying Pecaf gets punished with the humans, and Guts tries to prepare, but his body goes limp. Turns out, her dust is poisonous, and with the wound on his arm, it went straight to his bloodstream. The only thing that saves him is Jill diving in front and calling out to the Queen, calling her Rosine. This causes the Queen to pass over the two, forgetting her attack. Instead, she actually seems to recognize Jill. The two share a look before the Queen flies away, taking her swarm with her. Jill repeats the name Rosine just in time for Guts to collapse to the ground. The poison from before is weakening him. Jill helps get Guts to his feet just in time for the rest of the village to arrive. They scream at Guts for burning the barn, mistakenly believing he destroyed all their winter provisions, when we actually saw that the elves took care of that. Still, they're pissed off. They're especially angry at Guts using the boy from before as bait, but Guts isn't having it. Instead, he simply laughs at the villagers, asking if any of them even tried to unlock their door when the boy ran out of his house. The villagers change the subject, not wanting to be called out for their cowardice, and demand he hand over the children, Jill and Thomas the boy. Jill's mother even calls out for her, but she's hesitating to run back. She seems conflicted on leaving Guts behind. And even though she starts walking back to her fellow townsmen, a part of her regrets stepping away. All just in time for the big reveal. Remember, apostles turn back into humans when they die. So that swarm of bug monsters Guts just set on fire in the barn, they transform back into normal children, now burning in the remains of the barn, in front of the horrified villagers. Guts decides this is the best time to take a hostage, grabbing Jill and putting a knife to her neck. The situation is tense, as Guts tries to walk past the angry crowd. Puck is in a complete panic, as it seems like everything Guts does just makes the situation worse. One of the men in the angry mob tries to attack him, but Guts presses the knife hard enough against Jill's neck to draw blood, scaring away any more attackers. Guts and Jill make their way out of the mob, Jill's father watching them from his hiding spot but cowering away when he sees Guts. Jill is visibly upset at the idea of her father not even trying to save her, but she stays quiet almost as if she was expecting it to happen. They manage to get out of the village, where Guts lets Jill go. Buck is angry at the fact he even took her as a hostage in the first place, and then calls attention to the wound Guts put on her neck. But Guts grabs the elf and sprinkles her neck with the healing powder, basically telling him shut the fuck up, she's fine. Guts apologizes for what happened and goes to quietly walk away, only for Jill to state the obvious. He's on his way to Misty Valley, but she wants to come along. Turns out that Queen Elf is a friend of Jill's who went missing some time ago, Rosine. Guts tries to make it clear to Jill just what is going to happen when he gets there. Rosine isn't human anymore, and he's on his way to kill her. 
What does Jill honestly think she can do? In essence, he tells her to stay far, far away, leaving Jill alone with her thoughts. She's frustrated with her own life, how no matter what happens, nothing ever seems to change. It's all just shit, and she's stuck living with it. We come back to Puck lecturing Guts about how he shouldn't be cruel to a little girl. She gave him food and shelter, and he repaid her by telling her to fuck off. Then he sees Guts is still bleeding from his arm wound. He offers to heal it for him, but Guts pushes Puck away too, saying he's sick of him and wants him to go away. Puck tries to play it off as a joke, but Guts isn't joking. He throws him to the ground and walks off without him. Puck is upset, but he spots Jill walking up to him. She's gonna follow no matter what. Now here is what is possibly one of the darkest moments for Guts. Not THE darkest, and dear sweet Christ that's saying something, but this moment is up there. He's resting at a campfire, trying to purge the poison from Rosine out of his body. He's puking profusely, resorting to eating a snake raw for food, and even eats coca leaves. Not only was he poisoned, but he's got major blood loss and hasn't slept in four days. All the while, images of the burning children are in his mind. He prepares for a long, painful night. But then his brand starts to bleed. Now that the sun is setting, something is taking shape in the campfire. The demon child found him again, and taking no time to start annoying his father, it seems as though it summons a horde of flaming spirits, the dead souls of the children Guts killed in the barn fire. Now we don't know if the demon child specifically brought them to Guts. Every time it showed up, it never seemed outright malicious, so it would be strange if it suddenly started attacking him, especially when it seems to instinctively recognize Guts as his father. But Guts blames it for the ghost coming after him, so fuck it. The dead children close around Guts, all screaming and crying as he cuts them down. It's actually not made 100% clear if they're intentionally trying to kill him. Sure, they're surrounding him, but the spirits aren't bragging about drinking his blood or devouring him. They're sobbing, crying out for their parents they're afraid. It's quite possible that the ghosts are still just scared children deep down, but because they're in flames, anything they touch burns. And regardless of whether or not they're purposefully trying to kill him, Guts doesn't seem to care. He's happy to cut them apart all over again, now visibly deranged. Meanwhile, Jill and Puck are trying to track Guts down. Puck decides to use some of his abilities to keep Jill safe, scaring away any animals that might get too close, since they're running around in the middle of the night but he can't help but bring up what she already knows deep down. Even if she finds Guts, it's not like he's gonna protect her from the swarm, and her friend isn't gonna become human again if they meet. She's probably gonna regret all of this when it was over. Jill admits that's probably true, but by this point she's already far enough that it would be a waste to turn back. She needs to see this through to the end. They manage to spot Guts' camp in the distance, and find him in the midst of a full-blown rampage. He's cutting through the phantoms like a madman, just slicing through everything he sees. Even after seeing one of the ghosts begging for his mother, Guts doesn't hesitate. He's becoming less human as the fight goes on. Jill is horrified at the sight, but Puck is used to it, and unfortunately for them, some of the dead children materialize right behind them. Guts, absolutely consumed in his psychotic bloodlust, takes a swing in their direction. The only thing that saves them is Guts stopping his sword at the last second because he recognizes Jill. This half second of hesitancy gives the ghosts a chance to pile onto Guts. He collapses on top of Jill, grabs onto her, and leaps off the cliffside away from the demons. The two are knocked unconscious and wake up the next morning. Jill is okay, but Guts hurt himself against the rocks falling down and can't move. He asks her to sprinkle some of Puck's dust on him to heal his wounds who is also not exactly in a good shape after the fall. She helps treat his wounds while Guts asks why she followed him. Turns out it was because the queen called Puck Peacalf. It's a local fairy tale that all the children know. Peacalf was a boy born with pointed ears and red eyes, bullied by the local children, though his parents always loved him. Eventually, Peacalf began to believe that he wasn't with his true family. They weren't his real people. Nobody else had pointed ears or red eyes, so why was he different? He ran into the forest to try to find his real parents and eventually stumbled onto a colony of elves, who also had red eyes and pointed ears. But they swear Peacalf isn't one of them. Instead, they explain that some time ago, a man and woman came into their forest to save their baby. It was sick and dying. The village forbade anyone from entering the forest and speaking with the elves, so the couple broke local law to try and save their child. The elves granted their request and saved their baby, though in exchange, the baby was altered to look like an elf, given their eyes and ears. But the parents didn't care, they were just happy their kid was alive. Peacalf, understanding that they were talking about him, realizes too late his parents really were his true family. 
and tries to run back to the village. But by the time he came back, a hundred years passed in the outside world. Now all alone, Pecaf cried until his red eyes became even redder. Guts says the story sounds kind of grim, but Jill says that her friend Rosine loved it. In fact, she saw herself almost like a Pecaf type character. Now, I actually want to talk about the fairy tale a little bit, since you might think it sounds a little familiar. A boy living with his parents decides to run away because he doubts that the people around him are his real family. During his journey, he finally learns that the home he knew all his life was where he truly belonged. But by the time he came back, he was already gone. Ringing any bells? The story is about Guts. Now, I'm not saying the story is literally about Guts, but instead it's clearly supposed to remind you of his tragedy with the Band of the Hawk. Guts was convinced that the Hawks weren't his real family, that he still needed to find his true purpose. And it was only once he threw them away did he learn the Hawks were where he truly belonged. But when he came back, we all know what happened. It's beat for beat, honestly. Just a few details shifted around to fit a fairy tale vibe. They never draw an explicit comparison between Guts and Pecaf. It's sort of something you realize on a reread or two. Plus, the story has larger implications for a plot point that was probably going to be touched on before Miura died, but that's way down the line. Outright part 4, or if we're being perfectly honest here, 5 or even 6. Back to our summary, Jill explains that her friend Rosine was a neighbor girl who lived across the street. She was four years older than her, so the two bonded more like sisters. Rosine was a tomboy who liked to play outside in the woods, catching bugs and collecting little trinkets. One of the things she found was an egg-shaped stone with a human face. As the two became friends, Jill noticed that Rosine wanted to stay outside as long as possible, almost avoiding going back home. And the reason for it is because she too was dealing with abuse from her family. Rosine's family would fight constantly and it was always about her. Jill would always see Rosine covered in bruises from the beating she suffered from her father. This caused Rosine to latch on to the Pecaf story as sort of a way to escape her life, even going so far as imagining an alternate ending for the story. In her version, Pecaf really was an elf, and ever since he left home, he's been playing with his real family in the forest, far away from humans. She even claims that she's just like an elf and belongs in their land instead of with humanity. Jill says that the village they live in was caught up in a skirmish some time ago. Most of the people evacuated, but some of the women were left behind and raped by the invading forces, Rosine's mother included. So the reason her father is so cruel to her is because he's convinced she's a product of rape and not his actual daughter. It's something she's had to live with her entire life, never once getting a break. One night, as Jill is sleeping, she sees Rosine standing outside her window in the rain. She claims that she's running away to Misty Valley to be with the elves, and she just wanted to say goodbye to Jill one last time, leaving her box of treasures to her. Ever since that night, Rosine vanished from the face of the earth. The village organized search parties, but they never found her, and a few days after she left, her own parents disappeared too. Jill inspected the box Rosine left for her and saw that the only thing missing was her lucky charm the weird stone with a face. Sometime afterwards is when the swarm started to attack. Puck, picking up on what happened, shows off the bale of Guts collected all the way back in Volume 3, asking if the charm Rosine had looked the exact same. Guts doesn't waste time explaining the truth. The bailet is an artifact used to summon demons to grant the user power in exchange for a sacrifice. He puts two and two together and flat out says Rosine killed her parents to become an elf. Guts tells Jill one last time to walk away, that none of this is a fairy tale and she will die if it keeps going. Then to drive the point home, he says point blank he's not stopping his sword next time. So Guts admits he's fully willing to murder Jill if she gets in the way. He even insults her parents, calling her father a loser and her mother a coward. Which... Okay, I mean, in this specific instance, he's right, but, you know. This makes Jill snap, and she tries to slap him, but Guts catches her hand. He ends the debate by telling Jill to stick to PCAF before he goes to leave. She's just a kid. She doesn't belong in this really fucked up adult world he lives in. Puck attempts another lecture, but Guts traps him in a pile of rocks, fully abandoning the two to hunt Rosine on his own. Puck tries to comfort Jill, who's broken down crying from Guts' words, but she knows her life is a mess and having someone say it out loud to her just makes it worse. Well, as the two talk, a certain somebody flies down to meet them. Rosine. She's come with her swarm. Puck is sent flying from his prison, the rocks scattered when Rosine lands down, and Jill is petrified. Rosine walks up to her and puts a frog on her head. The elves all share a laugh, and we see Rosine actually does recognize Jill as her friend. It's kind of a heartwarming moment seeing these two damaged children share a moment together as friends. Rosine shows off her new form, excited at the idea of being a true elf, while Jill can't help but think about what Gus said, about Rosine sacrificing her own parents to have her wish granted. 
but Rosine's energy is enough to distract her. Turns out she wants to formally invite Jill to join her in Misty Valley. She swears it's a fun place where they won't have to worry about a thing. She pulls Jill close, intending on flying her over her kingdom, promising no cold, no mean parents, no big guy dressed in all black looking at them. Oh, fuck! Yeah, Guts takes a swing just dives right at him with his sword, and the ambush actually works. He manages to slice off a bit of her wing, something that causes Rosine to cry out in pain, showing off her more demonic form. The sight terrifies Jill and causes her swarm to get violent, but Rosine decides to leave once Jill begs her to stop. Just leave it be, let's go. They all leave, Guts and Puck left behind and watching them fly away. Puck then says that it looked like Guts was about to kill Jill too, to which he gets no response. The motherfucker was actually gonna do it. He pulls a so what. This finally pushes Puck over the edge. He kicks Guts in the nose and tells him to well and truly fuck himself. Guts doesn't seem to care, but does think that he might have actually hesitated when he tried to kill Rosine. Something held him back. Well, we cut to Rosine and Jill flying through the air. They stare down at the landscape in awe. For the first time, Jill sees the world as truly beautiful, even noting that her village is so small she can't even see it anymore so high in the sky. Rosine continues to manipulate Jill, swearing that being an elf is a magical experience. If she becomes one of them, she can fly all she wants. Rosine notices Jill hesitate with the decision and asks if she's thinking about Guts, implying she might have a crush on him. I have no idea why, I'm just chalking this up to Mysterious Stranger is cool and badass, therefore I like him. Because what experience with this band has ever pointed you to ever wanting to like him ever? Still. Rosine points out that he's coming for Misty Valley, but he'll never actually make it. Their kingdom is protected by real adults who care about children. Turns out Guts is indeed marching into Misty Valley, now consumed in the fog we saw the bandits run into in the beginning of the arc. His brand is spilling blood, so he knows he's getting closer. Well, he finally spots something in the fog, and discovers a pile of corpses shaped into a ball, just like when it happened with Rickert. A form forces itself out of the corpse ball, and we see it's one of the bandits. The rest of the group emerges out as well, all of them completely naked. They're noticeably brainwashed, talking about how they won't let Guts pass because he'll hurt the children. They charge at him, showing that they have enhanced speed thanks to whatever transformation Rosine put them through, but Guts makes quick work of the mutated bandits with his crossbow and throwing knives. However, one of the bandits transforms into an insect-like monster. This is the full extent of the mutations. The bandits are now a hybrid between man and insect. Remember, Rosine's hobby as a normal girl was collecting bugs, so this is almost like a sick joke she's playing on the bandits. Nevertheless, Guts is absolutely merciless. He's cutting through the monsters like a fucking tornado. The big bandit dude turns into a giant beetle and manages to pin Guts against a tree, trying to slice his head off with his pincers, but Guts slowly cleaves the guy in two, dragging the dragon slayer upwards and spilling him open. Guts even fires his automatic crossbow into his head in an attempt to shake him off. Well, at the same time, another mutated bandit starts skittering down to Guts' head to munch on his face. Oh, by the way, I completely forgot. If you have a phobia of insects, this arc won't be great for you. I probably should have put this warning earlier, but nah, you guys are cool. Well, Guts manages to kill the bug monsters by kicking off the tree and using the momentum to slice the one above him in half. Just as Guts finally gets a chance to breathe, he sees more mutants in the distance. A whole mass of them are running straight for him. So Guts readies his weapons and makes the rules clear. He won't leave even a single one of them alive. The assault begins, and it's a bloodfest. He kills as many of the mutants as he can with his crossbow, before whipping out the Dragon Slayer and jumping in. As the orgy of violence takes place, we see Puck is still seething over his fight with Guts. He takes a seat on a passing crow as he thinks about what could have possibly make Guts so hateful and angry. He knows the God Hand did something to the guy, and especially the raven-looking one, but Puck has no clue. Well, he decides he doesn't care anymore. Guts is an asshole, and Puck doesn't want to be his friend. Instead, he's gonna be friends with his crow. The crow is also an asshole. Thankfully, Puck is okay, though he unknowingly stumbled right into Misty Valley. Recognizing it as an opportunity to save Jill, Puck decides to infiltrate the valley and find his friend. Guts is still losing his shit something awful, by the way. He killed pretty much all the bugs, only two survivors left. We didn't see the actual fight in full, but it was bad enough that Guts is soaked in blood and heaving, and he's just ripping their body parts apart. He's actually kind of reminiscent to how he ended up during the Tower of Rebirth fight, only Casca isn't there to calm him down. Even the surviving bugs comment going, yo, what the fuck is wrong with you? Well, the two decide to transform into their insect forms, a large rhinoceros beetle and a praying mantis. Say hello to Biggie and Smalls. That's not their canon name, just sort of a nickname I gave them. You have the classic big strong dude working with a fast agile guy trope. 
and they're noticeably harder to fight than the mob Guts just slaughtered. As it turns out, these two have combat experience as knights. They know how to combo their abilities. Small slashing at Guts with his talons, and Biggie putting enough pressure to keep Guts from getting a chance to swing. And because Smalls rushes in with quick attacks, Guts doesn't have enough time to prepare a strike to kill a beetle. It's a bad situation. We cut back to the village, who are busy burying the children killed in the barn fire. There's so many bodies, they resort to a mass grave. The scene is grim. Parents crying over their missing children, possibly being among the bodies. But they can't even be sure because all the corpses have been burned beyond recognition. All the while, Jill's father is drinking on a stump away from the funeral procession. Fuck this dude. Like seriously, just fuck this asshole. This is the point where the Holy Iron Chain Knights arrive. Remember these guys? Yeah, they're actually kind of important for things to come. The village panics at the sight of them, but the local priest assures them that the knights are here to help. The commander greets the priest and reveals that they were sent to investigate a possible miracle. Say hello to Farnese. She's the leader of these knights. That's about all I can say at the moment, just know that she's probably one of my favorite characters. When this arc ends, you will learn a lot about her, so no reason to spoil things just yet. She orders her men to help bury the children while her and her top henchmen talk with the priest. He explains everything to her about how Guts and Puck showed up and set the kids on fire. I would hope he added the details about the killer swarm of demon elves that have been eating people for the last few years, but the most we see is them talking about the fire. Just saying, man, that, that shit's kind of important. You kind of want these guys to know about that. Well, Jill's father is actually eavesdropping on the conversation as Farnese explains her mission. She and her knights were tasked with tracking down Guts, referred to as the Black Swordsman. It seems as though Midland has been suffering from extreme plagues and famine. And on top of that, stories about monsters and spirits are becoming more and more common. So the Holy See decided to investigate the issue and discovered a common factor among all the witnesses. Whenever a guy with a big sword dressed in all black comes into town, everyone dies. And every time the Holy Iron Chain Knights investigated an area he was supposedly in, they found piles of corpses and destruction. Now Farnese herself is unsure of whether or not Guts actually exists. She theorizes he might just be a criminal with an exaggerated reputation, an entirely fictitious person made up to connect stories, or even worse, he might actually be important to that prophecy Farnese mentioned at the Red Lake. The priest admits he has zero clue about any of this. The most he knows is the guy went into Misty Valley, a place nobody has ever come back from. The priest wants to offer them a guide, but fuck, he doesn't want to risk anyone dying. Then Jill's father comes in to volunteer for the job. Yeah, he seems capable. He rushes back home, his wife crying over her daughter going missing after being taken hostage by a violent maniac just a day ago. But he doesn't give a shit. He came to get his armor. The way he sees it, he gets to live out his glory days one last time leading the knights into the forest. I know what you're thinking. God be praised, it's an actual miracle. Let this guy be eaten inside out by those horrible bug monsters. Well, I know how I know, because I thought the same thing. Dude's got a pretty good looking village wife, and all he gives a shit about is LARPing as a soldier again. Fuck you. Give me your wife. Hand her over. Give it. Back at the fight with Biggie and Smalls, we see Guts is still having trouble fighting them. They just refuse to give him a window to attack. He just can't fight both at once. He tries cutting off Biggie's head, but he can only wound him. His hips are too busy dodging to help him build up striking power. In order to kill them, Guts needs to find a way to hit them both at the same time. This causes him to have an epiphany. To kill them at the same time. Guts readies his arm cannon. He fires at Biggie, exploding his head, and the momentum from the explosion is strong enough for Guts to swing the Dragon Slayer so fast, Smalls can't escape. He managed to kill the two of them in one attack. It's probably one of the sickest kills in manga. Lost Children has some pretty fucking good fights. Well, despite his victory, Guts is wounded bad. He's bleeding a lot. Thankfully, no arteries were severed, but the sheer blood loss is beginning to become a problem. The one thing that saves him is some extra elf dust left over by Puck when he was sleeping in the pouch. Guts rubs the medicine against his wounds as the corpses of the mutants turn back into humans, now surrounding him in a scene of absolute carnage. Yeah, you can assume why an Order of Knights would assume a guy like Guts is just a psychopath and not a demon hunter. Because this... That ain't good optics, Chief. Jumping over to Puck, we see him still nervous about entering Misty Valley, though he's quick to notice that the place really does look like a paradise. The scenery is calm and beautiful, enough so that Puck can't resist but take a nap on a passing lily pad. His lazy snoozing is interrupted by the sounds of happy, carefree joy. Puck sees some of the demon elves playing catch with a ball. Oh, that's cute. Maybe they aren't so bad. Puck knows it's a bad idea to join them, they're technically the enemy, but it looks fun, and he can't resist trying to join the fake elves. They catch on to the fact Puck looks different, but they still decide to play with him. You know, that's really nice. It's really sweet to see that these guys maybe are just 
kids deep down, and they're, they're playing catch with a human eyeball. No wonder Guts set you freaks on fire. Puck is scared stiff, but the elves fly away when they hear the queen is back with a new friend. He uses this chance to slip further into the hive, seemingly focused around a massive cedar tree. The sight of the tree stirs something inside Puck, and he has a vision of elves flying past him. But before he can think about this any further, he spots Rosine sitting with Jill. The elves bring her fruit to eat, and Rosine continues singing praises about her new utopia, swearing that they'll always have food to eat, it'll never be cold, and grown-ups are not allowed inside. The manipulation is effective enough that Jill admits she would've come sooner if she knew it was like this, though she still stays on the fence about actually becoming an elf. Rosine gives her the rest of the night to think it over, but asks Jill if living in the village gave her the same wonder as flying through the sky. She leaves her alone just in time for Puck to come to the rescue. Also, you didn't see it, but Puck totally killed like 18 of them. He said he did, and he doesn't seem like a liar. You're a liar. Jill asks him about Guts, and Puck says in no uncertain terms that the partnership is through, even admitting that Guts planned on killing Jill when he attacked Rosine. The revelation actually doesn't seem to shock her, almost expecting to hear that was the case. And even though Puck tries to lead her out of the forest, Jill seems content to stay put. She's seriously considering becoming an elf with Rosine. Puck thinks the idea is ridiculous, they aren't elves, they eat people, but the peace of Misty Valley is starting to sway her over. In Jill's eyes, attacking people is just like what animals do, so maybe it's just in their nature. And the village is so much worse than the valley. Jill recalls the incident that caused her to run away from home. That friend of her father's that tried to enter her room actually attacked her that night, getting on top and licking her face. She barely got away in time and simply ran as far as she could. Remember the guy that specifically said sorry for last night? The reason Jill was kidnapped and met Guts in the first place is because he tried to rape her. The thoughts bleed over into Puck, who feels all the fear she has about life. He tries to argue that her mother would miss her, but Jill just rants about how terrible her circumstances are. She's terrified of growing up to be her mother, letting herself be bullied and abused, and doing nothing when her own children are bullied and abused. Or, even worse, she might become her father, cruel to her children only to make herself feel better. The entire time she's ranting, she's been unknowingly crushing Puck in her hands, to the point that he starts crying out that she's hurting him. This seems to snap her out of her episode and she releases Puck. They come back to reality, just in time to see the elf children putting on toy armor and weapons, ready to play pretend war. It's cute. I like the little bug armors. They have like little uh, ladybug shields and they're using little uh, pincers as swords. It's really nice. They look really happy. Holy fucking shit! Yep, they're not playing. They're really killing each other. Dismembering, decapitating, impaling. The grass is stained with blood. The victorious elves hold up their enemies' bodies up into the air, celebrating the end of their game. As Puck puts it, they're enjoying the killing. And only humans enjoy killing. Them or monsters. Of course, Jill's whole, they're just doing what they have to do logic would fall apart. We saw the elves act sadistic when Guts was fighting them. These things are not just misunderstood creatures, they're actually evil. And if you needed one last scene of Nightmare Fuel to tide you over, we see one elf chase another down. It gets on top, readies its stinger, and performs what the victim calls an adult attack. The elf is raped to death by a wasp stinger right in front of Jill and Puck, who have been watching the whole time. The elves even try presenting one of the corpses to her as a present, but Jill freaks out and slaps them away, just in time for the corpse to fall to the ground and revert back into a human child, as do the rest of the elves who died in the play war. Jill is staring at a field of dead children. The elves notice her fear and become angry, claiming she isn't a friend since she hit them. Jill freezes solid, but Puck snaps her back to the world and screams at her to fucking run. The two trying to escape the swarm by running for their lives. They get lost in the fog and Jill collapses to the ground in exhaustion. Puck tries to inspire her to keep going, but Jill points out they don't even know what direction they ran towards. They took a look at their surroundings and see that there's a bunch of orbs hanging from the ceiling. Puck goes to poke one of them to see what it is, and notices something stirring inside of it. One opens up next to Jill and reveals one of the demon elves hatching out of it. Yep, 
They ran straight into a nest of cocoons. Each one contains a human child that's transforming into an elf. Rosine calls it the Emergence Grounds. She approaches Jill, far more sinister than the friendly face she tried so hard to sell before. Rosine demands to know why Jill ran away, and she tells her about the carnage at the play session, but Rosine brushes it off by saying they were simply playing at war even calling Jill a coward for being afraid of it at all. Jill points out the obvious with the whole, you people are actually killing each other, but Rosine is convinced it's not a big deal, they'll make new friends anyway. All the elves were doing was simply pretending to be human. If Jill goes home, the real thing might happen in the future anyway, a real war. Rosine repeats her pitch one more time, become an elf and never worry about the big bad human world again. Rosine even promises to make Jill an extra special elf nobody will ever be able to hurt. She wraps Jill in her wings, letting her poisonous dust lull her to sleep. Rosine assures her she'll simply fall asleep and wake up as an elf, everything will be fine. Puck tries to talk her out of it, and Rosine tries to whip him with her proboscis, but she misses and accidentally splits open one of the cocoons, revealing the contents inside. Jill gets a good look at a half-transformed child, melted down and only vaguely resembling a human shape. Jill snaps awake and screams in horror, and to top it all off, the nest erupts in flames. All the cocoons burn as they look towards the figure in the distance. It's Guts, holding a torch. He lit the whole place on fire. Rosine sends her swarm after Guts, who uses his sword to cut down one of the flaming trees. It collapses on top of them, incinerating all the elves. The whole crowd watching in horror as everyone burns in front of Guts, code in a dark silhouette from the flames. Puck convinces Jill to run for cover, and as she moves she notices something about Guts. For just a moment, as he's surrounded by fire, he's the one that looks like a monster instead of the elves. So Guts came in like the wrath of God and showed very quickly he's not one to be fucked with. And the best part is, this isn't even the most hardcore part of the fight. It's the epitome of a chef kiss, because it's pure, unfiltered Kino. We take a break from the violence and see Jill's fathers leading the Holy Iron Chain Knights into Misty Valley. The knight Azan misinterprets the situation as a devoted father trying to rescue his daughter, but nah, dude's a dickbag. Farnese orders them all to dismount their horses and investigate the area, the roots of the forest making traveling by horse risky. And as they get ready to march, one of the knights finds what's left of the mutants guts killed, ripped to pieces. Azan believes it might have been from cannon fire, suspecting a black swordsman has an entire crew, but Farnese's second-in-command, Serpico, has another theory. One guy killed them. His evidence is that despite the damage done to each corpse, there's clear indication of an edged weapon being used. So instead of a cannon, it's more like a massive sword. Which, yeah, that's what happened. Jill's father confirms the theory, having seen Guts' sword back when they tried to attack him in the village. Azan believes this is proof that Guts is the one called the Hawk of Darkness, that bad boy that the prophecy kept talking about. But Farnese reminds him not to use the term loosely. Now we as the audience know that description they gave of the Hawk of Darkness doesn't exactly match Guts. But these are a bunch of stupid nobles, so it's okay for them to speculate. They don't know what we know. Well, despite her yelling at Azan for calling Guts the Hawk of Darkness, she herself calls him the Hawk of Darkness. Hypocritical bitch. Still, she swears to hunt him down and capture Guts. For God. Back to unspeakable brutality, and we see Guts shredding what's left of the swarm to pieces. As he fights, the corpses revert back to being children. So before long, the man is surrounded by torn apart corpses, which are then consumed by the fire. So Guts is surrounded by mutilated, dead, burning children. Berserk isn't very pleasant sometimes. The scene frustrates Rosine, who reveals that she has more friends to throw at Guts. She orders her swarm to chew him slowly, and they all latch on, biting into his flesh. It looks like he's done for, Jill freaking out and Rosine taking the chance to brag, but Guts calls bullshit on the idea. Instead, the man throws himself into the fire, setting himself ablaze to burn off the elves. Remember when I said that Guts was starting to work off crazy person logic? Well, this is what I mean. The dude literally set himself on fire to prove a fucking point. Now, it's not like he goes the entire fight on fire, though at this point you really wouldn't bet against that idea. Instead, he pierces one of the cocoons, letting the fluid inside put out the flames. They all stand in amazement at how clever Guts is. Or they're absolutely terrified because he looks like this. And this. Say hello to bad Guts. Guts could get pretty ruthless before. He was quick to execute enemies in Golden Age. And in Black Swordsman, some of his tactics could get downright dirty. But that's a far cry from looking like an actual animal. The dude is so consumed with hate that he's biting into the half-transformed corpse of a child. 
The dude's like a werewolf, just feral and mindless, because something is boiling inside of him. We just haven't been told what it is yet. All you have to know is Guts's very humanity is at stake here. I already said before that the conflict of the next few arcs revolve around whether or not Guts is evil. It's a pretty crucial element to what's about to come. Guts has gone so far downhill with his quest for revenge that he's not just violent. The guy is acting like a feral beast. It's to the point that Rosine asks what the fuck is up with this guy, and Jill can't help but think about the first time she met him. At first, she believed Guts was a ghost in the forest, but now, she has no clue what the hell this dude is. Rosine swears she's gonna kill him, but Guts is ready this time. She tries to dive down and attack, but he manages to deflect her proboscis and cut off her antenna, even cutting open part of her wing. Turns out, since the nest is full of trees, she can't fly at full speed and all the fire burns away her dust, meaning Guts has the perfect conditions to kill her. In fact, there he is right now. Yeah, he's not stopping this time. Rosine manages to dodge the attack and fly off into the nest, but he chases right after her, only to stop when his brain bleeds heavier than before. Jill and Puck are still spectating the fight, and they all see Rosine's true form as an apostle, a large moth. What the fuck do you want from me? Her whole aesthetic has been moths and bugs! Anyway, Rosine is sad to see her kingdom burn, but knows that there's nothing she can do. Besides, she can fly to wherever she wants. She can make a new kingdom, with Jill. The only thing she needs to do is kill Guts. Rosine flies through the nest, her speed now fast enough that the entire forest is shaking from the G-Force. Jill and Puck are sent rolling to the ground from the wind, and Rosine has her stinger aimed squarely at Guts. He tries to block the attack, but it's just too strong. He's sent flying through the air. Hell, the trees are bending from the speed. In fact, it's so fast, he couldn't even see her coming. The only thing that saved him was Rosine not being able to aim properly thanks to the loss of her antenna, but she settles on going for twosies. Jill and Puck are trapped in the middle of the nest. The wind Rosine is kicking up with her speed, feeding the fire. Now a blazing inferno. Rosine goes for a second attack, and once again, it kicks his ass. He knows she's aiming for his head, but at her speed, there's nothing he can do to avoid her. He's being thrown around like a ragdoll, plus the explosive sound she makes, implying that Rosine is literally breaking the sound barrier, deafens Guts so hard it's hard to coordinate his timing. Rosine notices Guts is still alive, and decides to go for one last attack, this time going slower to aim for his head properly. Turns out, this is the exact thing he needed to keep an eye on her attack. She's slow enough that Guts is able to see her stinger coming, so he prepares his defense. He puts his arm up. It's not his fault, he's very tired. Anyway, Rosine believes she can finally skewer his head and go for the kill. The stinger pierces Guts' arm, but he adjusts his iron hand to redirect the stinger away from his face. Now that Guts' arm is impaled with the stinger, he flies up into the sky with Rosine. She notices he's still alive, but decides to let him ride along, teasing Guts by saying they're going on a date in the starry sky. Rosine takes them high above the tree line, hovering in the sky. She notices Guts seems to be passing out from the blood loss, and continues teasing him, even saying he's not a bad-looking guy guys, so that must be why Jill has a crush on him. But the way Rosine sees it, only she can have Jill, so she plans on flying at full speed to rip him apart. She takes the time to plant a kiss on his face. And of course she forgets Guts has an iron cannon for an arm, like, everyone seems to forget this. Actually, in her defense, I don't think she ever saw it. But still, yet another demon that took the time to bad guy speech and got fucked up by the cannon. The wound sends the two flying straight to the ground. Guts crashing through the trees, angry at himself for supposedly blowing another chance to just kill her. Which actually hints at the idea Guts is dealing with a psychological block that's holding him back from just killing her. He sees Rosine reeling in agony from the cannonball, and Guts crawls over to his sword while she destroys the forest around her in frustration. Her intestines are spilling out from the wound Guts gave her, but she's still in the fight, royally pissed off and dedicated to killing him. He's covering his hand in sword wrapping, keeping the Dragon Slayer tight in his grip. He's infuriated at blowing so many different chances at just killing Rosine, and Guts wonders if it's from knowing about her backstory, or it's because Rosine still looks like a kid. And because he went soft on her, he's on death's door and can barely hold his sword. So instead, Guts decides to drown out his thoughts. Don't think about anything else but killing. Black everything else out. Give in to the worst parts of himself, and just move. But with Rosine now waiting for him to attack again, and his gunpowder completely spent, he needs to be smart about his next move. That's when he sees Puck and Jill walking around in the fire, hopelessly lost and unsure of what to do. And then Guts gets an idea. We see Jill and Puck trying to avoid burning in the flames, but it's too much to handle. Jill wants Puck to fly away, just abandoning her, but he's not gonna do it. He's not leaving her to just burn and die. 
Instead, he decides to try and split open the cocoons to protect them, like Guts did. Jill hates the very idea of still remembering what's actually inside of those things, and Puck asks if she has any better ideas. Jill breaks down crying, admitting she's a stupid kid and regrets ever coming to Misty Valley. She knew it would end badly, but she did anyway. Now she's directly telling Puck to leave. She wants to die. Puck tries one last time to reach her, but a flaming branch falls down on top of them, only to be saved at the last second by Rosine. She's wounded far worse than we thought, bad enough that even Jill notices it too. She swears that the two will run away together somewhere far away where no one will bother them, but it's starting to sound a bit hollow. She's close to the end. Well, hopefully the two can escape and Jill can wish her friend goodbye one last time. Not on this dude's watch. He dives out of the fire, impaling Rosine with a dragon slayer right in front of Jill, the sword right next to her head. Rosine reels back from the pain and accidentally tosses Jill into the fire, but Guts kicks open one of the cocoons to drench her in the fluids. The elf inside this one, partially alive. Rosine flies away again, Guts stuck to her back with his sword still straight through her body, and Puck immediately picks up on what happened. Guts knew Rosine would try and save her friend, so he took advantage of the situation. He was willing to let Jill possibly burn to death if it meant killing Rosine. Jill, meanwhile, has lost it, now just laughing to herself. Too much shit has crashed down around her, her mind is broken. Rosine is desperately trying to shake off Guts, but the man is not budging. She demands to know just who the hell this guy is, but he simply says she wouldn't remember. Out of all the people she's killed, there's no way she would remember why he's doing this to her. The very idea that a human is the one hurting her pushes Rosine past her own breaking point, screaming out that humans aren't allowed to hurt elves. She throws Guts off her back, finally removing him and the sword, and sending them careening down to the ground. For a brief moment, we flash back to Rosine to when she discovered Misty Valley, back when she was just a normal girl. She was happy in her little paradise, but it's immediately broken up by coming back to the fight. Rosine wants to finish off Guts. She flies towards him one last time, intent on driving her stinger through his skull, and she actually succeeds. The stinger goes through Guts, and it looks like Rosine won. Nope, it went through his cheeks. Guts is still alive, and he bites down on the stinger. What's left of his mind is just not there anymore. Guts finally found his chance, and he fucking takes it, cleaving Rosine open with the Dragon Slayer. Both sides are bleeding like stuck pigs and crash to the ground one last time. Rosine, in absolute agony, thinks about when she found Misty Valley. She waited for days, but no elves ever appeared. She knew deep down it was just a story, she never really believed in them, but it was all she had. It turns out, her parents actually did find her shortly after she went missing. Her mother was relieved running up to hug her, but instead of showing care or any sign he was happy that she was safe, her father savagely beats her, berating her for making the whole town worry, humiliating him, and accusing her of not being his real daughter. Yeah, he sticks on that shtick. He even beats her while just asking again and again were there any elves. Her mother tries to pull him off, but then he just shifts his attacks to her. The sight is too much for Rosine to handle. Her horrible home life creeped into her fantasy world. The one thing that was never supposed to happen is happening right in front of her, and she wants all of it to just go away forever which is enough for the bailet to activate. Rosine is back to her normal form, apologizing to her mother and father as she hits the ground. Jill and Puck find her bleeding, her left arm completely severed. Puck recognizes that she's dying, and Rosine talks about how there were never any elves in Misty Valley. It was all just fairy tales for lonely children, but Puck swears that was not the case. He says that they really did live in the forest, but for some reason they all left. Still, their energy was strong enough for him to pick up on. Rosine is confused by what he's saying, since she doesn't realize Puck is a true elf. The three share a moment as Rosine finally gets to see one of the creatures she spent her whole life dreaming about. It's actually pretty touching. Even if Rosine did so many nightmarish things to people, all this time she's just a little girl that's been hurt by the world. That does not excuse what she's done, not by any means. Yet you can't help but feel a twinge of sympathy for her. She made the choice to sacrifice her parents, yes, it was her decision, but it was because so much of her life was already a living hell. She just wanted to stop, to go away. Once again, it's not an excuse. She's made countless other people suffer just as, if not worse than her. Rosine is a monster that deserved to die, but she was just a child. A child that, sadly, has met the consequences to her actions. And those consequences came in the form of Guts, a specter of absolute vengeance that would not go away. Now, this is actually something I really like about some of the Apostle fights in Berserk. The demons are sadistic monsters, yes, but they always feel human deep down. 
There's some aspect of their personality that makes them feel like flawed beings, and this almost always ends up being the key to defeating them. The Snake Lord was so prideful that he wasted time bragging instead of killing Guts. The Count was so attached to his daughter that Guts could exploit her as a hostage to kill him. Wylad was so impulsive and carefree, Guts could outsmart him and use ambushes to his advantage. And now Rosine is dying because she wanted to protect her friend. This is what makes these fights so special, at least to me personally. The Apostle fights in Berserk are more character studies for the demons. You see a wide range of emotions from each one, and it almost always ends in an ironic comeuppance. Ironic in that the human aspect to the demons is what kills them. Hell, you wanna know why Nosferatu Zod was such a dangerous fighter? Not just because Guts was inexperienced. Dude didn't fight too many demons when he killed Wylad, but because Zod didn't have any weaknesses to exploit. There was no relative to take advantage of or obvious personality trait that hindered him. Zod well and truly abandoned his humanity to become what he is, and in a strange way that made him far deadlier than any demon Guts fought up to this point. Oh, by the way, speaking of Guts, the dude explodes out of the lake next to the cedar tree. He's coming, and he's still angry. Rosine and Jill are blissfully unaware, the two sharing their last words as the demon girl dies. She tells Jill that she's lucky if she found an elf, so everything will be okay, and Rosine swears that Jill will be okay even if bad things happen. But their conversation is cut short by Guts. He's not finished yet. He wants more. He doesn't say a word or even acknowledge Jill or Puck are there. All he cares about is Rosine. Jill begs him not to hurt her anymore. Rosine is already dying. He should be satisfied. She even asks why he hates her so much, but he just pushes her away. He readies one final blow, directly aimed at Rosine's head. Puck too weak to stop him with his chestnuts. Jill jumps on top of Rosine to protect her, but Guts isn't stopping. The only thing that saves the girl is a crossbow bolt right through the abdomen. We see Jill's father is the one who fired it, bragging about taking down the Black Swordsman. The Holy Iron Chain Knights are right behind him. They open fire on Guts, intending on saving the children, not realizing Rosine is actually a demon. Still, Guts retreats into the forest, the knights chasing after him and leaving the rest behind. Jill's father attempts to join, but Azan tells him he should simply be thankful his daughter is safe. Once they're gone, he lashes out in anger, his one chance to experience battle one last time squandered. Of all the people that died in this story, and this douchebag got to live. Shit ain't fair. Rosine stands up, much to everyone's shock, but she's delirious, saying she needs to go home. Rosine takes flight, Jill stopping her father from firing at her with his crossbow. Rosine hallucinates as she flies through the air, thinking she needs to be at home in time for dinner, otherwise her parents be worried. Her stomach rumbles, Rosine wondering what her mother has cooked, as she falls to the ground, finally dead from her wounds. We see the ending lines of the PCAF story repeated as Rosine dies, finished off with an image of a happy Rosine eating dinner with her parents. Pretty heavy, right? Well, it's not finished just yet. There's still a bit more to close us off with this chunk of Berserk. We come back to Jill, having watched Rosine fly away for the final time. Her father is complaining about losing a shot at glory, barking at Jill to come home with him. But she can't go just yet. He tries to strike her with his cane, but she dodges out of the way, even ordering him to go back to the village without her. She needs to find Guts no matter what. Puck warns her that he's dangerous, a deranged mess that just tried to kill her. And why does she want to find him anyway after all the shit she's been through? And Jill admits she doesn't know, but things simply can't end like this. We find Guts hiding in a cave away from the Holy Iron Chain Knights, who are having difficulty tracking him down in the fog. Guts rips out the bolts from his body, and spots Jill staring at him. She managed to track him down. She asks Guts if he's leaving, and he's quick to berate her for coming along, saying nothing good ever happened when she followed him, and if she keeps tagging along, it'll only happen again and again. Jill swears that when she almost fell in the fire, Guts went out of his way to save her, and begs him to let her come along. She doesn't care where they go so long as it's far away, and here is actually a pretty heartbreaking sequence. Guts tells Jill to look around him, at the shadows in the cave. They are completely surrounded by evil spirits. If Jill wanted to come with Guts, it would mean following him into the hell he lives with every single day. The hordes of the dead constantly attacking him. The Apostles. That's all that's waiting for Jill if she comes with him. And Jill learns very quickly she isn't even safe from the ghosts. They crowd around her just like they do to Guts. He saves her from them, letting Jill fall to the ground and cry, and he covers her in his cloak comforting her as he lays out the truth. There's never going to be a utopia or a paradise she can run away to. It's better to stay where she is and try to change things than look for a way to escape. For the first time since they met, Guts shows a true care for her safety. Everywhere she goes will be painful, but she's safer at home than anywhere close to him. 
Guts walks off, urging her to simply walk away. Jill doesn't want to go back to her horrible life, but Guts isn't giving her a choice. He's leaving without her, and the horrible monsters are leaving with him. Soon, Jill is left alone. She closes out our arc with a final narration. She never did find out who Guts was, and she's not truly sure what all the horror really meant. The Misty Valley burned away, all the wonder and mystique is dead. Jill looks up at the sky, the mist cleared away, and thinks about her flight with Rosine. The excitement she felt wasn't there, but the sky is clear, like after a storm blows through. Jill's childhood is officially dead. In a way, she's finally grown up. She knows she can't run away from her problems like Rosine, and she can't go to war against the world like Guts did. Instead, she'll go home and try to change things for the better. It'll be painful, but that's life. As a parting gift, Puck gives Jill some elf dust and one of his chestnuts to sting her dad whenever she wants. He's still going to travel with Guts, whether the big guy likes it or not. She looks at Puck one last time, thinking about how elves look best flying in the sky. We close out Lost Children with Jill returning home with her father, content with whatever is about to come. So the arc ends in a very bittersweet manner. Rosine is dead. Guts is a wanted man, and so many innocent kids died in horrific ways. But deep down, there's some hope that things can be better. Even though Guts well and truly became a monster to kill Rosine, he still decided to save Jill. In his own twisted way, yes, but he still managed to protect her from the world he's forced to live in. A lot of people love this arc, myself included. It's just such a beautiful, tragic story. You see all the elements that make Berserk special focused down and refined into one standalone arc. Yeah, there's some outright nightmare fuel. Plenty of fucked up and downright disturbing scenes. Which doesn't help considering this is all about child suffering. But underneath the horror, you have tragedy. Not just from Rosine and her whole story. Jill herself is a very tragic figure. And with her perspective, we see a new side to this horrible, fucked up world. The children in the story can't catch a break, dealing with abuse, whether it be physical, emotional, or even sexual, dealing with cruel, uncaring parents that are supposed to represent figures of kindness and safety, and any kind parent figure they might find are powerless to stop tragic things from happening to their own children. There's also the conflict that this arc deals with that's a bit understated. It's all about the effects of abuse on children, and we see it in a few different ways. Rosine represents a child desperate enough to escape their own circumstances to the point it leads them down an ever-darkening road, to the point she became a literal demon and subjected other children to fates worse than death, so she can play pretend forever. She didn't want to face what happened and try to become stronger for it, she just succumbed to the despair. Guts represents a kid that uses his trauma to attack the world around him. Remember, Guts himself went through some fucking shit as a kid, which followed him into adulthood, not even talking about the Eclipse. He doesn't try to run from his issues, he tackles it and tries to kill them. He would rather burn the world to the ground, but this isn't healthy either. Hell, it drove him insane. Jill is supposed to represent the best case scenario. Yes, her life is full of pain. It's something a kid should never have to deal with. But instead of trying to escape or lash out, she decides to try and find something to be happy about regardless of her circumstances. She'll try and make the world better around her. In a way, Lost Children is a coming-of-age story for Jill. She matures into a better person by the end, beginning as a scared girl that just wants someone to protect her from the big scary world, and ending as someone willing to stand up for herself. It's not a complete happy ending, a lot of bad things happen that she's never forgetting, but you feel like things might be okay. Hell, it's the entire reason Guts gives her the speech in the first place. He's not gonna let her ruin her life sticking with a guy that's actually cursed. Everywhere they would go, it would be nothing but nightmares for her. So Guts, in his own way, tried to save her from that by pushing her away. And when all the bluster and anger and aggression didn't work, he finally broke down and was just honest. He made it clear, stay away. And Jill finally got the message. This is by zero means a happy ending. But it seems like Berserk might be starting to get less depressing, guys. Alright, and now we finally get to close off our video with, uh, you know, a nice little ending message. I'm still kind of torn whether or not the subscribe star donators are going to be here because that's it. It's more of a sneak preview than the full video itself. Or if some people really don't care for Conviction at Large and just want to listen to Lost Children and the prototype, you have this video. So, that was kind of the general idea. And, you know, I, I, I kind of thought, eh, fuck it, why not? And as stated, this, this specific chunk of the manga will be in part three as well because as I view it, you can do Lost Children by itself, but you cannot do Conviction without Lost Children. 
you need that beginning context to explain how Guts meets the Holy Iron Chain Knights and all them. So it, it's still going to be in part three, and that's why I'll have timestamps where you can jump around and be able to skip past it if you've already seen this and just do not want to hear that summary again. But yeah, that, that was the idea. So, yeah. Still, you know, I, I had fun with this. I had a lot of fun. Lost Children's probably one of my favorite arcs, and I just thought, you know, this was really cool. Really cool chance to do something like this, so... That's about all I really had to say. See ya.